This is the Ending Next Podcast, broadcasting live from the UNI Podcast Studio in sunny South Dallas. My name is Hugh, and I get to lead a movement for those who have been marginalized and excluded. We have a clear mission to spread the light of inclusion. Our goal each episode is to highlight the work and the workers ending exclusion in their own space and place while providing you awareness and opportunities to join the movement. We do our best to find the right people, ask the right questions, so that we all can take the next right steps and make together history. Today is no exception. Renee Dunn, founder and CEO of Amazi Foods, is in the house. Renee, it is great to have you and thank you for the work you do. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Well, we're going to jump in. Question number one, share a little about your personal, maybe professional history and share with us your why, your personal why. Sure. Um, Yeah. So I, first of all, thanks again for having me. I am... uh, Never sure where to start with this, um, but I'm I'm uh, you know today I'm the CEO and founder of Amazi Foods, um, and we are a socially driven snack company that works to create more sustainable and equitable supply chains. Um, and so I'll kind of start with the journey that led there because I think that's what you're looking for. Um, <laughs> so I I. Um, have two kind of paths that merged together and led to this. Um, One of them was sort of in the fitness and wellness industry. I have been a fitness instructor of sorts, you know, in different modalities for the past 12 plus years um, and uh, had gone through various phases of uh, deep diving into, you know, different dietary preferences and needs, mostly because I personally was dealing with a lot of health issues. So I, I kind of got into exploring, you know, the world of quote unquote whole foods, um, and, and, you know, dabbling in different kind of anti-inflammatory type diets and, Today I'm I'm pleased to say I eat normal, <laughs> uh, but but I think it was highly educational in terms of learning kind of how we fuel our bodies and 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 um, sort of what different foods and and their effects mentally also can have on people. Um, so I kind of had a passion for food, a passion for natural foods, um, and sort of was paying a lot of attention to the kinds of products and brands that were being put out into the world um, simultaneously. And, uh, and, and maybe more, more significantly, I was, um, um, I have a background in development economics. I did my thesis in college, um, on, uh, entrepreneurship in Uganda. I lived there. I studied there, spent quite a bit of time there and was really noticing sort of a twofold problem emerging wherein I saw, uh, you know, there was a huge amount of local resource in Uganda Um, and not just, you know, the actual produce that they grow, which by the way is among the tastiest fruits that I've ever tried and all organically grown and in abundance and just crazy. Um, But also just really untapped um, economic potential. Um, And, and, and the more I dug into it and interviewing different entrepreneurs in the area and and building relationships with local business schools and really just trying to understand how local entrepreneurship was working, I really came to see that, um, there's a big disconnect between sort of what we would consider resource rich countries or countries that are kind of at the bottom of our supply chains and the countries that do all of the innovation, all the value addition, all the brand making that you see on the shelf, you know, they are completely disconnected from where they're sourcing their products. So even in the wake of ethical sourcing and fair trade, where we're buying, you know, maybe at higher prices from farmers, they still have no idea and, and have no access to the steps in between that creates, you know, for example, that final chocolate bar that you eat with fair trade cocoa. Um, it's great that the farmers are getting more money, right? But they're still at the end of the day, kind of stuck at the bottom of this huge commodity chain. And if you think about all the steps in between that make money and create jobs and create skills and, and just build out, um, 
those are all removed from those countries. And so essentially what happens is most entrepreneurship and, and jobs available really looks like kind of that commodity level trading, which doesn't create jobs, doesn't create market access, doesn't create sort of the opportunity to earn more on your, on your dollar or what you're growing. So um, I really wanted to find a way that would, you know, not only highlight the, the amazing fruits that they grow there, but also train local people to, to make snacks that would fit the international market because there's no reason they can't do that. Um, there's, you know, there's nothing stopping them really from, from being able to, to learn how to do that and, and, and learn how to innovate on what they're growing and understand sort of what market preferences are like and tastes and all that. And, and that way they get, you know, let's say cost of goods is 50% of the final product. They get the full 50% as opposed to just that, you know, 1% or 2% of what went into the bag. So, um, that was sort of the inspiration. And, and I guess, you know, my why is really, if you boil it down is just trying to create a system that is more equitable and inclusive, um, uh, when it comes to our food. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that's amazing. Um, and the, give us, so why, why Uganda, you mentioned Uganda, you, you said yeah. it there obviously, but why, why have you s- you know, sole focus is sourcing from you got why? Yeah. So I think maybe one day we'll expand once I have 10 of me. Um, but I think, uh, uh, I think we started there for two reasons. One, or I could, I'll say three. One is, as I alluded to just the resources themselves, the flavors and the availability are unlike I've ever had before. Like I could try a pineapple from there and it would be 20 times better than the pineapple I've tried here. Um, it's, it's, and the fruits that they grow are very unique to the U.S. palate. And I knew that if we were going to get into the competitive space like snacks, um, we had to be bringing flavors that I thought would would stand on their own. You know, I wanted to be able to offer a snack that it's not just like any other bag of dried fruit on the shelf. I wanted to make sure that people, when they were trying our products, they really were having these bold, unique, sort of globally inspired flavors. Um, so that's, that's one key reason. Um, you know, you can't have a, a socially driven business if you don't have a business at all. So, so that was one, (laughs) one thing. Um, the other, the other key thing is the problems that we were solving. So, um, Uganda is, I think one of the most entrepreneurial countries in the world, but has also one of the highest unemployment rates, particularly among youth. Um, it also has one of the highest rates of transient businesses. So businesses that will either go out of quick uh, business quickly or uh, will fail quickly. Um, and, and for me, that was sort of the, the problem that I was studying in my thesis was kind of like, people are so entrepreneurial and, and starting businesses all the time. How is it that jobs are not being created? How mm-hmm. is it that like, we are not, you know, building businesses that, that are differentiable or, or, or uh, can scale, you know, that that's not kind of happening. Um, and so for me, kind of building an industry that was rooted a in what they were growing and B in actual market demand <laughs> um, yeah. was, was a good sort of case study to try to, to solve that, that problem. Um, and I think third was just the relationships that I had built, you know, I, I loved living there and I was struck by it and something special, you know, uh, went on for me when I lived there. And I definitely, uh, had the chance to really immerse in the culture. Like I learned the local language. I lived with local families. I had local food. I did my best to kind of understand, you know, as best as I could, uh, the local culture. And, and, and for me, it was like, well, this place has certainly shown me a lot and taught me a lot and let's see if we can work together. So I would yeah. say those are the top three. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. I know you have a, you have a factory in Uganda. Um, mm-hmm. And so take us inside. Uh, what would we yeah. see? What, what, who would we see? Paint a picture for us also of the impact of, a, of your factory in that community that it, that it sits in. Yeah. And you'll have to excuse me. I think I have a cold. So hopefully it's not coming off too much for our listeners <laughs> no, here. You're allowed. Um, I'm allowed. Okay, we, great. We, we're in, uh, we include. You include people with colds. That's nice. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I'm happy to share. So this is a really incredible 
piece of our business and, and kind of was the ultimate vision. Um, it is majority Ugandan owned business, which is of course our goal is to partner with local businesses there. And, um, but, but we own some shares of it and, um, that way it's sort of what you would consider a vertically integrated supply chain. So we actually own, you know, components of the manufacturing, which allows for increased transparency as well as some risk mitigation when it comes to quality and all that good stuff. But, um, what's incredible about the facility is that it is entirely Ugandan run and operated. It is located in sort of a semi-remote area, um, a place that doesn't have any other uh, industry opportunity really. Um, and, and it is buzzing. <laughs> when you walk in the doors, it is, um, we just completed actually a couple months ago, one of the top certifications for food safety in the world. Um, it is a pristine facility with youth working. So most of our employees are under the age of 30. Um, I'd say 70% of our employees are female. Um, the lead production manager, head of everything is female. She's a young 28 year old girl and she or woman, I guess. And she just leads an incredible team. They, they have, you know, when you walk in, there's a big sorting room where they sort through all the fruit. They make sure they're picking the best quality fruits. They're separating out anything that doesn't meet specs. It'll enter in the facility and then they'll start cleaning, cleaning the fruits and, and, and chopping them up and adding the necessary spices. And, and we have a bunch of dryers and they'll, they'll prepare them in there and then package them finally at the end. Um, it's really a start to finish process. And, um, there's also a big kind of, uh, eating area, a hangout area, um, where there's every day there's breakfast and lunch and then dinner for anybody who's working the night shift. Um, and, and just, it's great. Like if you, if anybody's listening to this, like, and has an Instagram, you can go to <laughs> our Mozzi Foods Instagram and we've posted videos of, you know, the, the kind of, uh, incredible uh community that really the Uganda team is building there like they and I've done a number of interviews too just hearing about how it's it's a it's a work environment unlike they've ever had before and I can't take responsibility for that you know I think that that's really something that they've been able to cultivate with with the level of partnership that we have and and nobody uh I think they just do a really good job of making them feel like a family and, and a part of a bigger supply chain. Whereas a lot of other businesses that do kind of production or are kind of factory based in that area are very uh, transient for them. They feel disposable. And I don't think that occurs um, at our facility at all. And, and we've actually heard some crazy stories about what people will do to like fight to stay at work when they're sick or things like that. And <laughs> it's like, you know, uh, it's, it's great to hear people are excited to, to go to work and, and be a part of the team and learn how to make these products using fruits that they've seen their whole lives, but have never seen used in these ways. So, uh, yeah. Oh, cool. Thank you for giving us a peer in. That's amazing. So mm -hmm. if I am an investor in Amazi Foods, um, what, what outcomes am I investing in that, that matter to you? Yeah. So I think there are the impact ones and obviously most investors want their money back. Uh, <laughs> so there's, there's two sides. Um, I think, you know, on the, on the consumer side, on sort of the, the product side of things, I think you're investing in uh, a white space um, in, 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 two areas. I think obviously the dried fruit set, I think when you think of the world of dried fruit, it's generally pretty boring. We tend to use pretty commonplace fruits. Um, there's not a lot of focus on bringing sort of um, lesser known items into the space as well as different flavors and textures. So we add spices to the, the fruits that we make um, and offer sort of not only increased nutrient density by doing so, but also just new flavor experiences that aren't really there for other, other products like ours. Um, I think another big thing too is um, we, <laughs> we have um, only three ingredients in every bag um, and, and it's totally 
um, sugar-free, it's allergen-free, all that good stuff. Um, but because of our unique flavor, we also appeal to more of a mass market. So initially when we first launched the business, I was thinking, oh, we're going to be sort of this niche product that like the most crunchy of consumers would want. And it's going to be those people who are like super nitpicky about their labels and super nitpicky about, you know, all this stuff. And I think we certainly hit that target. But what I'm learning is that because the flavor is so good, people who previously reached for fruit snacks, for example, like a Welch's fruit snack or previously reached for potato chips are glad to reach for our items because not only do they, they not only do they have, you know, a simpler ingredient list or have more nutrient density, sure, that's fine for them. But really what's the kicker is that it actually tastes like something that they want to eat. Um, so I think that that is, is big for us. And then on the impact side, um, you know, you're really investing not only in a huge job generator, it's also what I would consider to be one of the more sustainable supply chain models that exists in our world, especially in today when supply chains are all the, all the rage and all the conversation, like people get alarmed by international supply chains, but if you build them in a transparent and localized way, you actually come up against very little disruption. We've actually had very little issue sourcing because we keep all of our sourcing so hyper-local production start to finish. We're not getting ginger from China, something from Turkey, something from India, bring it all here, compile it together. Like we focus on creating a, a local economy that is circular and connected. And mm -hmm. I think in doing so, you have lower cost of goods, you have better margins, you have higher transparency, you have a story to tell. Um, and it's really, you know, I think in that regard, really a leg up on the business as well. Yeah. You better get ready to create 10 of you. That sounds awesome. Uh, I'm working on it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, it kind of brings me to what uh, we call the ending X stat of the day. Uh, brought to you by the Accountable Healthcare Staffing, named one of America's best recruiting and temporary staffing firms by Forbes magazine. Um, I read that Amazi pays farmers up to 67% above market price and that 55% of your farmers are, in fact, female. Um, that's an amazing stat uh, or a couple of stats. Unpack that impact for us. Sure. Yeah. So you're asking this at a great time, too, because I actually just got back from Uganda about a month ago and I had the chance to interview a bunch of our farmers one on one. Um, which obviously puts voices behind these stats. Um, and it's, I think, you know, touching on two parts of that. Um, one is I, I'll start with the latter part, the, the majority female farmer sourcing. Um, there's a whole lot of literature that, that um, supports the idea that directly supporting females in the household um, has much higher return, not only for those females, but also on the household income as a whole. Um, is, that, is that Uganda specific or globally? That is a global stat generally. Um, there have been a lot of initiatives to try to put more money directly in the woman's hands when it comes to her household. Um, I think for two reasons, you know, obviously even in the U S you see the wage gaps <laughs> and such. Um, mm -hmm. But, but I think, you know, having, control over um, money for women in the household often means that that money is being reinvested either in their children, in their education, in side businesses that they're able to run, um, in, in goods for the household, that kind of thing. Um, whereas, you know, it, it doesn't get as evenly distributed sometimes when directly goes the males. Additionally, just if you look at inclusion of gender, um, I mean, we all know what it does to include both genders. You end up with greater economic opportunity for everybody because otherwise only 50% of the economy is making money. So, uh, so, you know, I think just as an uplifting economic statistic, you know, making it more commonplace for, for women to earn and have some control over their finances only betters, um, everybody in the community, um, I think when it comes to the wage itself, you know, you mentioned up to 67% above market price um, that, uh, you know, and we, we guarantee a threshold because it changes depending on seasonality, but it's anywhere between 33 to 67% is generally where we fall. Um, and, and, it, and also depends on the fruit. But I think what that means is that it's, 
it's changing the business opportunity for for these farmers and and what they invest in because these farmers their their farms are their business and and they have x amount of land and they have x amount of capacity and um the common way that things work is is often through middlemen so tradesmen will come through the villages or wherever they are they'll pick up what's ready, they'll leave. Um, they're kind of subject to pretty low market prices, um, whatever it is they're being offered. And it's not consistent business and it's not, um, <laughs> it often doesn't cost or cover their costs of actual labor. Like oftentimes these, we work hundred percent with smallholder farmers. None of our farms are commercial, which in and of itself is a lot of legwork. But, but what all that is to say that they are the ones going to the field. Like they are the ones putting in the work to do it. It's not like they can hire people and do it and, and you know, what have you. So there's not, there's a lot of labor and energy that goes into it. And when you are offering a farmer more than what they often earn, it does two things. One, it builds trust. Um, you know, they're more eager to do business with you. Um, and, and, and they, they, it's a more reliable use of that square footage that they have, but also it allows them to reinvest that into either their farms or other side projects that they have. So, you know, yeah. anecdotally, you know, I've spoken with some farmers where that additional funding has allowed them to purchase more kinds of fruits that they grow. They've been able to diversify what they grow and therefore have more business throughout the year, as opposed to relying on certain seasons for just whatever they had the money to plant initially. Um, another thing too, is they, they maybe reinvest in, um, you know, uh, having some labor <laughs> to help them on their, on their fields. And then that creates more jobs in the area, but also gives them a little bit of a break. Um, so I think um, just seeing that increased margin really goes a long way in terms of kind of what their day to day lives can look like. Um, yeah. I mean, if somebody gave me a 67% raise, I'd, I'd take it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what, in your perspective, from your perspective, what are the keys to what you call an, a more a more equitable supply chain? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of buzzwords these days about sustainability and, and what does that mean and and uh, what does inclusion mean and what does equity mean and you know I think uh, it's really easy to kind of greenwash yourself. It's really easy to stamp your buzzwords on and for me, um, I think it's it's couple parts. I think one big part is thinking about it, not from just one lens. Um, and, and, and I think that kind of leads to the second part, which is that it's always evolving. Like, I think people are really quick to be like, we're sustainable. Boom. And like, it's like, yeah. okay, well we could always be more sustainable. Like there are always more things that we can be learning to reduce the negative impact and increase the accessibility or increase, you know, um, the positive outputs that we're doing. And, you know, to give an example for Amazi, like I think for us, we at our core are an, are focused on economic sustainability, right? Like what we do is more than just pay a farmer a good price and leave. Like we're really trying to build a fully start to finish supply chain in the country that we're sourcing from that in and of itself could, you know, not only be more equitable by actually allowing countries that have typically been excluded to be included, but also, you know, create sort of a model for like, okay, this works. Now we can open another factory and that would work. And now that, you know, like just yeah. modeling is, is really um, a part of that. Um, but, you know, to, to hone in on, I guess what I was saying before about always evolving, like we're still doing a lot to make sure that our environmental sustainability is there, right? Like we source organically, we work directly with only organic farmers and we train on organic farming. Um, you know, we, we compost, we do a lot of things. Um, you know, we offset some of our shipping carbon emissions, but you know, we still use plastic packaging. Uh, we still use electricity to power our facility. So what does that mean? It means that we have to keep working to think about, okay, well, can we switch to solar? When can we switch to solar? In the meantime, if we can't do not plastic packaging, can we offset our plastic use? And, and so I guess for me, that's sort of like to build a truly like 
sustainable and equitable supply chain really means like always looking at all the parties involved and all the lenses and, and it doesn't mean you have to do them all perfectly at the beginning because as a small business, I think you end up potentially shooting yourself in the foot if you try to tackle everything at one time. But I think, you know, it, it really is about always being critical of like, well, where could we further improve and, and what are we currently excluding or what are we currently not focusing on that we could. Um, and, and again, I think within reason and within, you know, resource, you can't, Right. Like I said before, like I've been told this many times by mentors um, where I'd like kind of get stressed out about like, oh, well, we haven't finished our organic certification yet. Or like, you know, it's like, well, you can't, you know, <laughs> you can't have a social enterprise without having an enterprise. And if you, if you, if you, you know, don't do things at all, you can't do things the right way. So that's okay. sort of my, my approach is like, obviously we were founded upon this very key mission. Um, and as we expand the good that we do, um, we always have to make sure that we're also staying like in business <laughs> as we go. No, no, that's huge. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, I, I, you've referenced this multiple times. In my opinion, there's so much marketing and so many claims around fair trade and sustainability that it's hard to know which brands are actually engaging with the local communities, positively impacting in tangible ways. What, how do you decipher and what, what should we, the audience, be looking for as we yeah. make those kind of, you know, we're trying to learn, be, not be ignorant, make better choices in a sense. So, and support yeah. and support the right, you know, yeah. companies and organizations. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. <laughs> um, I think one good way to, to decipher um, is, and, and, you know, luckily the internet makes this pretty easy, um, but I think a lot of smaller brands, especially, put in work to actually like show you the story and the behind the scenes. Um, you know, I think it's, it's a tough um, from theory to practice question, I think, because when you're grocery shopping, you're not going to, every time you see a product, go to their Instagram and check it. Like you're not going to do that. Um, so I do think it's a bit of like here and there of like, you know, sometimes we have to rely on what the packaging says. We have to rely on, you know, okay, this has a certification in this, I can trust that certification, but I would challenge people to not just focus on the certification because for us, for example, we haven't had the resources or the time. We are only just now starting our organic certification process, but all of our products are organically grown. And there's also a lot of research that shows that while an organic certification is positive for the environment, it can be very challenging for the farmers themselves. Um, basically they could be having in the, in the time that it takes to transition into full organic certification. And I'm just giving this as an example, farmers can often lose out on business. So it's a big request for them to kind of be like, Hey, trust us, you know, we're going to buy from you when you finish this in eight months, but we can't buy from you now. Um, it's kind of a tough thing for a farmer who focuses on farming as their livelihood to invest in. So so sometimes, you know, it's like, yes, organic certification is to be trusted and is something to look at if you're looking for something that environmentally does better for the world, but it's not always the option that's the most uh, socially conscious sometimes. Um, and I think sometimes the, the way the grocery industry works, it's very much like you're here, or you're there, and there's not a lot of room for like, oh, we're in the process of our getting our certification. You like that's um, that's just something to think about. You know, it's like I wouldn't necessarily count somebody out if they were able to tell you their sourcing story and 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 illustrate to you how what their practices are without that seal. I would honor that. <laughs> um, I think it's the brands that only rely on the seal and only rely on these buzzwords without telling you the what and the who. 
I think that that's where things kind of get greenwashed. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm certainly always still learning about the different terms in the industry. It feels like they're new ones every day and it's really hard to keep up with. Um, but I think, I think small brands make it easier because usually they are relying on their story and it's actually easier for them to implement a lot of these things, even if they don't have, you know, every single certification in the book. So I guess this is a call to shop small when you can, uh, uh, because I do think that we rely so much more on our stories to get people in because we're not, you know, Nestle, you don't see our brand and be like, I know them and you buy it, it's brand new. And so we have to find ways to invite you guys in and, and we tell more story. <laughs> so, so I think, um, it is a good opportunity when you have the time to, to, you know, try a small business instead of, you know, the larger competitor, oftentimes their practices are, are really thoughtful. Um, and, and, uh, yeah, I think you're just seeing more and more of that in this space, which is great. If everybody is working harder to do good things, we'll usually end up with a better outcome. So, <laughs> so for sure. Yeah, that's great. I love that. Um, I got. I'll, I'll, I'll ask one more question, then we'll we'll kind of begin to wrap. So, as okay. you, you, I know you've, uh, I, I believe, if, if I'm correct, you guys started in 2016, um, a small business trying to accomplish, you know, a big mission. What's the hardest lesson you've learned through that process? Oh, just one, huh? Um, <laughs> I think one, mm, which is my most valuable one, you know, I come back to this one often when I'm asked a similar question. I think it's the idea of like being able to put your blinders on. Um, you know, I think it's really important to collaborate and understand, ask questions. And, you know, another thing that I could have said was like, you only know what you know, you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> That's like a big lesson. Um, but, but I think really for me, it's my first time as an entrepreneur in this space. It's my first time in food manufacturing. It's my first time in branding. It's my first time in, in the majority of this stuff. Right. And, um, it's really easy to look at what other people are doing or even take advice from other people and, and it not be right. Um, or trying to be at a different timeline that someone else is at. Um, and again, that doesn't mean live under a rock, but, yeah. but I think something that's been a consistent challenge for me is like, what are you focusing on right now? And like, sorry if that's not this thing that you see this other brand doing, but you need to just be here and do this. And, mm -hmm. and it's a continued challenge for me. And I think that that extends to also who you ask questions of. Like, I think it's really easy to be like, well, I don't know that. So I'm going to ask this person and you can ask people for their opinions till you're full of opinions. Um, and then you end up stuck again. <laughs> so nice. I think it's like really learning to be like, okay, you know, I could ask all these people, but I'm also just gonna like try and see what I come up with and then maybe validate that. Or, you know, I think that that concept of being able to be like, this is our race to run and we have to make decisions that run our race, not that race over there. <laughs> so yeah, I think that that's been one of the most challenging things to get. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think, um... A, having a very clear North Star and saying we're running this way and we're going to align all the things, all the decisions to that is, is huge. And I also think everyone is willing to give you their expectations. Like no one is going to set your boundaries for you. No one is going to yeah. follow your, I mean, they're just, everybody wants to weigh in. And that's, I'm glad you said that. I think it's huge <laughs> for the audience there, especially if they want to be entrepreneurs. Um, all right. So that leads me to what we call the ending X need to know, need to know. So name an author, a community leader, a speaker, an artist, someone that our audience or something that our audience needs to know about. Cool. Um, I have a bunch that I love. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I will caveat this by saying that I actually try not 
to get too deep in either like one person and or like kinds like I'll preface this by saying I do try to read business books quote unquote but I find that sometimes they fall into my previous question of like I get really caught up of being like oh we're not doing any like (laughs) we're not doing any of that or like we're not we haven't done that yet or I don't know so I, I try to make sure that before I, I do read these things, I'm, I'm in the headspace to do it. But I will say, you know, one thing that's never been bad, um, you know, the work of Brene Brown, for example, on um, vulnerability, but also just like being able to be um, emotionally intelligent and open in the workspace and in relationships. I think like, that's just coming to my mind because I think as an entrepreneur, and there are many tools to use for this, but it, it is a pathway in like who you are as a person and like your own personal development. Um, you know, I think it's a practice too of separating yourself from the enterprise. That's certainly a practice as well. But I think a lot of it, especially in the early days are like, who are you as a person? And like, how are you reacting to things? And how are you building relationships? And who are, how are you showing up? Um, and so I certainly think her work is, you know, notable in that area and you certainly can't go wrong uh by doing a little Brene Brown deep dive so yeah yeah Yeah. I like to call them trusted advisors um cool well we end every podcast with what we call our the ending x blazing five hot takes from the hard work so here we go I'm gonna I'm gonna pelt you with five hard questions number one uh as a food and fitness expert what three things should every grocery cart have in them? Every grocery. Uh, um, Amati Foods jackfruit juice, probably <laughs> number one. Um, um, yeah, I'd say some sort of fresh fruit or veggie um, of your choosing and then your favorite protein source. So for me, my grocery cart would always include chili lime jackfruit juice. <laughs> um, probably broccoli or arugula and salmon. Those would be my, I get those every week, probably on the week. <laughs> um, but yeah, big on, big on those. You got a carb, you got a veggie, you got a protein. Good. Behind the scenes, our video crew is praising your, your take there. Uh, Number two. What's one of the most significant hurdles you faced in your journey and how did you navigate it? I feel like, especially in the beginning, my most significant hurdles were me. (laughs) Um, And so, yeah, I mean, you know, I think definitely the first three years or so was just a lot of me getting really indecisive or freaking out and not knowing the way forward. And a lot of it is just going through it, (laughs) going through sort of that mental game with yourself of like learning to be patient and learning to kind of be a little bit more confident as you go, at least for me, that was like a very, uh, I'd say held us up a lot. Um, but I think, you know, obviously with, uh, we had a big supply chain change about two years ago, right before COVID actually. Um, and that was a big hurdle where we switched from importing bulk product that was made there and packaging it here to packaging it fully start to finish in Uganda. Um, and this is supposed to be a short hot take, but in short, what it did was um, we we could no longer rely on a third party manufacturing company because they didn't have the QC and they didn't have the com- transparency that we wanted. Um, and so we had to really like actually build out this facility that I was describing earlier. Um, and, and it was a big undertaking uh, to, to switch out. Um, but in the end, it really did allow us for better cost of goods, closer to our mission, all that good stuff. But I will say that that was necessary because we couldn't scale otherwise. So um, yeah, I'd say that was a pretty significant turning point in the business. Awesome. Number three. For a next generation leader uh, aspiring to change the game in a tangible way in their community, what piece of advice would you offer? Um, get close to the problem. Uh, you know, I think it's really easy, especially in the impact space to assume what people need or what your impact should be. And 
And for us, it was many years of building relationships and getting them wrong in the beginning and handling them not in the way that they actually wanted it to be handled and learning and changing. And so I think unless you're actively, you know, making an effort to, to go back to the problem that you're solving, get close to it, get familiar with it. Um, you may not have the impact that you want to have. So, uh, yeah. That's really good. I hope, I, I'm hoping millions of people listen to this. That's really <laughs> good. Too. That's really good because it's, I, we work, we both work in the impact space and I see so many people that make so many assumptions and they, they weaken their impact. Um, and even sometimes I think ignorantly celebrate an impact, an impact that they think they're having, but yeah. it's not true. It's, I don't know. So anyways, yeah. yeah. Um, Number four. If your life's work were being summarized in a news story, what would you want the headline to be? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> um, maybe this is, a, this is a tough one. Um, <laughs> Told you hard, hard. She did it, exclamation point. She did it. <laughs> no, um, I, I don't know, probably something like, a new model for sustainable business emerges or something like that. Cause my hope is that I can become less and less involved as the years go on. And it just becomes a natural way for sort of like these countries that have typically only been at the resource level. Like I hope that that starts to change and they're more involved in, in production and market access and communication and, uh, yeah, I hope that we just kind of pave the way and people start to do it themselves. So that's kind of my hope. Yeah. So maybe trailblazer. There it is. Maybe. All right. <laughs> Number five. I, I, I thought this might be fun. I don't know. Uh, I'm sure that Uganda and its people have taught you a lot. Uh, what's one thing Uganda has taught you that you could pass on to us? Ah, that's good. Um... <laughs> um, I think especially for Americans that like time isn't everything <laughs> like, you know, the fact that, you know, you plan to meet at two, but it's at four the way, you know, that's not that Russian, that, that sort of hustle is not, uh, not worth as much as, you know, right. being respectful and kind and, and, uh, you know, I don't know. I think <laughs> there's just, I think you often laugh at, you know, especially the beginning would laugh at me or any Americans, how we get so worked up about the plan, the plan, the plan. And it's like, what are you even, what is this plan that you're talking about? Like, <laughs> what? like that's not going to happen. So I think just like that ethos of like, yeah, you can plan, but in the end you're a fool. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So how can we best follow, support, stay up to date uh, on what you and your your team are doing? Sure. Yeah. So um, amazifoods.com is our website. That's A-M-A-Z-I, like amazing, amazifoods.com. That's also our Instagram handle. It's A-M-A-Z-I foods. Um, yeah. I mean, you can find us in all Sprouts locations, all the fresh market locations. We're in a few airports as well, about nine airports, um, as well as a bunch of independents. So we'd love for you to kind of join our newsletter, stay in the loop. We do a lot of behind the scenes kind of blog posts along with, of course, special deals. <laughs> so yeah, just, just join our newsletter, follow us along, and, and we'd love for you guys to be a part of the journey. Yeah. Shop local. Um, uh, cool. Well, it's been a pleasure. Um, that's it. And that's all for this episode of the ending X podcast. Uh, if this was helpful to you, uh, please say it, spray it, wheel it, deal it and share it on your social channels. And you can learn more about what we do and check out our episodes at www.endingxpodcast.com and make sure to follow us on the gram at ending X podcast. All right. Well, that's it. And that's all. Thanks again. Grace, peace, and much love. We'll see you, Renee, and we'll see everybody else. Thank you.
is the is the um, American palate like it, it feels like to me it's so fast food you know like so uh, what is that processed food based yeah. that it almost it's almost like if you handed a kid you know like a, a jackfruit chip that they would be like their palate would almost exclude the chip you know what i mean yeah i think it's evolving um i think it's a lot of parents are actively looking to introduce their kids to better for you products um you know i think there are certain kids who yes they would try they would try jackfruit chew at home and you know be like what is this um but kids who are used to you know I think it's the healthy sector is growing immensely, I think faster than some of the other categories in the store. And even though I think almost to the point where everything is now like healthy, healthy, healthy. Um, But I think taste buds are shifting towards the more natural, you know, I think um, certainly takes a lot of education on our part and just setting expectations of what the flavor is going to be like, but um, yeah. And I mean, that's part of why most brands like this don't go mass market off the bat. You know, they'll go through the natural channel first and, and meet consumers kind of that already want that kind of thing, as opposed to just launching to every single Kroger and expecting everyone to love it. You know, I think we first go with the places that are more natural, you know, are more discoverable, are kind of would pull the right people in, um, before you kind of try to, to get sort of the mass consumer at, you know, wherever that might be. So. Well, 